Hello, everyone. Good evening or good morning or afternoon, depending on when you are watching this broadcast. It is your girl, Marcy Thomas, founder of the BGC Book Club and Brown Girl Collective, of course. And once again, I'm excited to be here with you for a conversation with another outstanding Black woman writer, which is all that we focus on here in this space because we need these spaces and rooms of our own. So if this is your first time joining us, please, if you don't mind, drop a, where you know that's your first time in the comments. Let us know where you're joining us from, just um, you know, to, as a way of welcoming and we know who all is here. Um, I am based in the Atlanta, Georgia area, so if you're in this area, shout it out. Who knows, I might see you at a book event at some point in time. So tonight's book, I'm really excited about. I had an opportunity to read and really delve into the story, and I can't wait to talk to you about it. It's The Women Could Fly by Megan Giddings. So by means of introduction, Megan Giddings has degrees from University of Michigan and Indiana University. In 2018, she was a recipient of a Barbara Deming Memorial Fund grant for feminist fiction. Her novel, Lakewood, was published by Amistad in 2020, and it was one of New York Magazine's best 10 books of 2020, one of NPR's best books of 2020, a nominee for two NAACP Images Awards, and much more. Just last, a couple of years ago, she was named one of Indiana University's 20 Under 40. And this year, she has an essay in The Lonely Stories, and her second novel, The Women Could Fly, was published just a couple of weeks ago. She currently resides in the Midwest. And so without any further delay, let's welcome to the room, Megan. Welcome, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yes, <laughs> yes, we have to show our copy. So it's so exciting to have you here. And I thank you, um, you know, as we were talking before, you've been traveling and doing some other things. So it's good that you could take time out of your busy schedule to join us to talk about your book. I'm honored to be here, though. I love coming to these events. Oh, yes. And we're honored to have you. So, uh, wow, there's just so much to talk about in the book in general. But before we get into that, just... How did it feel to put out your second book? Because you had a, a great book, award-winning book a couple of years ago, and now this is your second. So how does it feel to be doing this again? <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of feels like the first time because my first one came uh, when we were very locked down. Mm -hmm. So my tour disappeared and everything that I was going to do, it, it was gone. So this time... I still feel like I'm learning things because I'm actually in bookstores for once. I just mm. did a festival, which was great, but it was also really intimidating to actually like see people instead of, I'm used to events like this where it's just me and someone like right. you talking. So I feel more relaxed there. Although now that I'm saying that, I'm starting to get a little anxious, <laughs> which is always the way. But I think the other thing is, um, it, it's been kind of hard to put this book out because it's so much about women's rights. Mm -hmm. And I did not expect that it would come out right after everything that happened with Roe right. or how things have been progressing. So just suddenly like so fast in this country. Yeah, that is true. Cause as I was reading the book, there were just so many things that I can say it feels, it definitely feels current because of yeah. the things that are going on. And even though there is a bit of fantasy and, and magic and things like that in the story, it also feels very real. And there are a lot of things that I could just say, mm-hmm, yeah, I see that, yes. And the, th the thing that you were writing it before all these other things started to happen. So it's almost like you had a little um, psych, you know, psychic ability. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first person to say that. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you're doing some black girl magic over there. <laughs> I promise I'm not. <laughs> um. Well, for those who haven't had a chance to read the story yet, just tell us a little bit about what it's about. So it takes place in a world that is really similar to our own, except for the fact that if you're a woman who's not married by 30, you have to make a choice. You either give up your life, your job, your ability to have money, you let a male adult take responsibility for you, and you register with the government as a witch. Hmm. 
or you get married and you get to keep everything, but it means your husband's taking responsibility for you so that if you are somehow still a witch, well, you've got a nice man to take care of you. And I, I wrote this book because I want to think a lot about mother and daughter relationships where Joe, the main character, her mother disappeared around Joe's 14th birthday and it's been 14 years and she's still looking for her. And I also want to write a lot about friendship where Joe has a close friend, Angie, who she's known most of her life and think a lot about all the different ways that women relate to one another, but also sometimes how we force each other to conform and how sometimes our friendships or relationships can give us the space to like live our dreams, mm -hmm. which it feels really earnest to say that, but it's true. Mm -hmm. That is true. And, and as you're saying, I'm thinking, yes, it is a, even though it's not necessarily intended to be a love story, it is a love story of sorts. And the love story is that friendship, you know, just the fact that a lot of times, as you say, we show up as our most authentic selves in our in our friendships, or at least we should be able to. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I've often said, you know, the breakup of a friendship of a friendship can sometimes be more devastating than a romantic relationship for that yeah. very reason. I I think more and more that like romances are great, and I, I love being in relationships, mm -hmm. but. When I think about what actually keeps me inspired or motivated sometimes, it's those friendships where you they feel less likely like someone could leave you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's very true. Um, the whole point of women having to either be married by 30 or have, you know, get registered with the state. <laughs> this takes place in Michigan, which, you know, we both have some time spent in Michigan. So I thought it was funny as I was relating to some of the Michigan things that you mentioned in the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but just to think that, you know, okay, if you're not married by 30, that you, you know, some man has to kind of take responsibility for you. And a lot of it felt like, some of the rules that we know of the past, like I know that there was mm -hmm. a time in history where say a woman couldn't have a credit card without her woman without her husband signing for it and things of that nature. Yeah, women couldn't have credit cards until 1974 mm -hmm. if you were single. Um, and I mean, some of this was also built on kind of a joke because even still in the Midwest, if you're not married by like 28, you start getting a little bit of what's going on there. What's wrong with you? Why, why aren't you doing the thing adults are supposed to do? And I, I thought it was a little funny to make it very serious instead of just that annoying thing like, your rude uncle asks you. Right, right, right. And it's something that a lot, a lot of women face. You know, regardless of you know the ethnicity, ethnicity and things like that. In this book specifically, our main character Josephine is a, a woman of mixed race, but of course she identifies as a black woman. The world sees her as, as such, and I just found it interesting because it talks about um, at a point in the book you talk about yes, black women are expected to do this, but for a lot of reasons we're less likely in the story and sometimes in real life. It's a lot yes. of reasons we are less likely to um, get married due to a lot of you know different things society and say and otherwise. So tell us a little bit about that. What made you include that um, specifically in the story? It's something I've been thinking a lot about. I was actually having a conversation with my brother and he, he's getting his PhD in black studies right now. And he, he'd come home from class and he started talking to me about this article he read. I wish I could remember the name of it. If I remember, I'll send it to you. Okay. But it was about how often black women get disillusioned at like an early age because we're so often the caregivers in our family where even if your mom and grandma are still around, you're getting prepared more to take over all of the like manager tasks they do for everybody else, making sure everybody's fed, everybody has money especially if you're the oldest or second oldest daughter, they, they start preparing you for that work. It's a whole, it's a whole job and you do it out of love and care for your people. But it was also about like the level of burnout black women feel 
and why sometimes we're more reluctant to get in romantic relationships even because we've seen what it's like even if we don't have to do it we've seen our moms carry the family we've seen our grandmas carry the family and it feels like just the ways that we look at family are different than other people and it it makes us a little more wary like you you have to really love someone is how i feel when i talk to my black friends like we we have to or we don't want to give that up because we know how much we're going to love and take care of people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mean, there's always this thing of, you know, black women, the black woman as the strong black woman, the, you know, the super woman, the, you know, all of mm-hmm. these things that get put on us because of these roles and things that we're expected to um, have in life. And, it is interesting that even in the story, we talk about Tiana, who is Josephine's mother, the woman who has disappeared. Um, prior to her disappearance, she was one of those women. I loved her because it was like, when she would get in the mom's group, she wouldn't just talk about her husband and her, her daughter all the time. She was talking about the stuff that she was interested in. So she, you know, she would realize that she was a full person apart from her yeah. role as wife and mother. And- I think so often we're encouraged not to think about ourselves as full people anymore. I I was talking to a friend who's, how old is she? She's either 25 or 26. Mm-hmm. And I, so I have about 10 years on her. And we were talking about how does it feel like to go into 30? Like she had this idea that life kind of just stops. And I was like, no, life is better because you you have this deep relationship with yourself you know who you are you you want to find a way to please yourself you don't you don't feel as lost because you know the things that you want or how to make yourself happy i mean that doesn't fix everything right but it gives you more of a sense of purpose but i i remember having that same feeling because i the number of women i knew it, it was hard to find role models who wanted to put me more toward being creative or having a career. They wanted me settled, which I, I think that also came out of love, but it made finding a path harder for me too. Right. And I find that interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm a little older than you. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's like, I, one of the things that oftentimes has frustrated me, I am a person who is single and not been married. So I'm definitely you know, a witch <laughs> <laughs> in that regard. <laughs> I mean, you're a good witch though. You're a whole I'm life a here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> in that regard, according to this, I would definitely be one. Um, but um, just the mere fact of understanding that we do have value as women. And sometimes I think not to say that partnership and marriage and all of those things aren't important. However, there are, we are so much more well-rounded as human beings in general. There's all, you know, there's, you know, like in the case of Tiana, there are the interests that you have there, you know, there are the ideas that you have, you know, the vision that you have. And those things are equally as important, even though you may be a woman. No, because you're a woman. Right. Not even. <laughs> right. Right. You know, uh, oh, well, you're a woman, you got good ideas. Oh. <laughs> Imagine that. You're a woman and you're smart. Wow. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's something else. Um, one of the things, one of the other things that I found real interesting, you know, with the story talks about as well, you know, women's rights. And, you know, you do oftentimes write from a feminist perspective. And, you know, that is clear in the story. But you also talk about, you know, of course, women's rights, um, LGBTQIA plus rights, you know, the rights of Black people and all of that are kind of centered in this story, really. Um, And this character really (laughs) touches a lot of those, you know, hits a lot of those high points. How important was it for you to have a character who does cross so many lines? I think it mattered a lot to me because I I think on average, 
I think so many of us cross so many lines mm -hmm. and that I, I think one thing that fiction hasn't done really well is they, they tend to stick, especially black woman, one box where you are a black woman. But I think many black women now we identify as LGBTQIA. We, I think that we also have a lot more space in our communities. And I, I think the other thing is just that I've read so many books that don't let black women be complicated, right. but I think what's beautiful about us is that most of us are willing to sit in our complications. We, we see it. We want to have like a rich, interesting life. We want to be in the world and you kind of have to be a complicated person to do that, especially if you want to make your own way. Right. That is true. Well, what's that saying? Uh, Well-behaved women don't make history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes, you know, just being, you know, sticking to one path necessarily isn't always. And actually, there's something in the book that says that I'm trying to find my notes, something about uh, there are set paths most people should take, but the best things were found by slipping away. I'm kind of paraphrasing that. I like how you put it though. For a minute, I was like, oh, did I write that? That's <laughs> yes, you wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, you know, oftentimes and being able to slip away and find, you know, find who you are, find, you know, yourself in that. Um, wow, there's just so much. Um, there's also a quote in the book where it talks about, you know, specifically black women, how women of color have less rights, less likely to get married by 30. We already talked about that. Less likely to have resources, you know, have their children <laughs> taken away from them, all of these sorts of things. And, you know, those, those are the things that in reading the book, I'm like, yeah, that is true. And I like the fact that you spoke to some of those social issues and social realities. Yeah, it was really important to me to have all of those in there where I, did, I didn't want it to overwhelm the book and I hope it didn't or doesn't for any of you who are reading it right now or later. But I also didn't want to pretend that those things aren't real where I wanted I wanted to look at the world and see that even where like Joe does, isn't financially precarious at all, but those are still the truth of it. Like money, money doesn't erase systemic oppression. Mm -hmm. We want to pretend sometimes right. it does, but it does not, at least in the U.S. Right. Right. That's very true. Um, another thing in terms of Black women and, um, you know, being witches, of course, in this book, <laughs> not, not just Black women, we're witches or witchy. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that I, I found it interesting, it says, well, a couple of things, devil loves Black women. Well, like, wow, does he really? <laughs> no. <laughs> But the other that I find interesting, that Black women um, are prone to being witches because of voodoo and Santeria. So talk about that a little bit, or why people might think that. You know, I, when I was doing research for the book, I, I was reading a lot about witches and how they've been perceived. And it was really interesting to me how often um, today, like, if people are talking about witchy or witches, it's it's white women. Mm -hmm. But often when people were seen as like supernatural or pushed toward, and it, and it relates again to like so many social issues, but it usually was black women. And especially if we weren't following Christian religions, mm -hmm. if we were bringing anything over of what our historical religions where it was seen as witchcraft rather than prayer or ceremony. And I wanted to get into that level of othering too, where I, like, I, I don't think that a lot of us want to kill chickens or right. oh, yeah. do that anymore, but <laughs> it's still part of our heritage that got destroyed is having the ability to even choose. Did we want to follow these paths depending on, where our ancestors came from. And so I wanted to bring that because so often our just our faiths, our languages, our cultures, they were they were destroyed or made other through 
the genocide of slavery. And now years later, we're trying to find like that level of both. How do we reconcile the fact that some of us are Christian or Catholic, but we also want to respect our ancestry and find the path of just feeling connected to the people we lost and we'll never truly get to know. Mm -hmm. That's true. So I'm thinking, you know, even like with some people who are embracing African traditional religions as well, you know, other African traditional religions and um, parts of the culture is that if you look at even in a Christian space, um, a lot of black churches are doing a lot of the things that are a part of our history anyway, whether it's, you know, the stomping of the feet or yeah. you know, and different things like that, or, you know, certain levels of dancing or, you know, or crying out or whatever. That's, mm -hmm. That comes from someplace else. Right. I And I didn't know that for a long time. I was raised really Catholic by my parents. And then the first time I went to a black church, it was such a different experience. It felt more like church than going right. to mass where you sit quietly and you look up at Jesus and he's on the cross and mm -hmm. you just are alone. Mm -hmm. It definitely makes a difference. And there's a, a level of communion and community in, in those spaces that may not necessarily exist in other spaces, which we are basically a communal people. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I mean, that's the hardest thing to get people to understand. Like, there's a place in the book, I can't talk too much about it because it's a spoiler, mm -hmm. but a lot of people have been calling it like a utopia where it's this perfect place. And I've been kind of, it's one of the big things I've been pushing back against when people say it, because I, I really wanted to make a space in this book that is actually about community and communal spaces. It's it's not a utopia, there are people, but you're trying to find a way to listen to other people. You're trying to do everything for the good of your community. And it's been really interesting to see like how divided that's been on race, where if I'm in a predominantly white space, they're always calling it a utopia. Mm. And most of the time when I'm in a black space, they link it to that, like that's our culture. We're there for one another. We try to build things. Mm -hmm. It definitely, it definitely makes a difference. You know, just your point of reference, you know, in, in telling the story and other people reading it, like, you know, they don't understand, but I, I didn't, well, I guess because of who I am, I didn't yeah. think Utopia, I thought, oh, this is a community, you know, when some things happen that we won't talk about, but, <laughs> <laughs> but this is, a com you know, a community. Of, of, of people coming together and, you know, learning how to live and to thrive and support one another and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, um, and we talked about this a little bit before that I got from Josephine is that, you know, she is this 28 year old woman who's in this space where she's told who she's supposed to be, mm -hmm. but there are parts of her that don't want to be who she's being told to be. Um, and as we go throughout the story, we get to see how she grapples with that. Um, you know, she's in a relationship with someone and she, she calls Party City, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, she's in a relationship kind of situationship with someone, you know, mm -hmm. and even though she's at that stage or maybe she should be thinking about getting married, she's kind of saying, eh. Yeah. Oh. I, how do I put this? I, in some ways, I think that's the closest to me in the book where Joe has that push and pull. I've been thinking a lot while I was writing and now while I'm touring and talking about it, about how often I felt really divided, especially when I was younger, between what, what felt what I was told was good for me right. and versus what's actually good for me. Like one of the hardest things about being me and also being a person who loves me is that I'm a very independent person. I, I have a really hard time letting people take care of me or being told what to do. I mean, that's why I write because right. it's, 
it's much harder for people to tell me what to do. And I and I am married, which <laughs> I know, it always cracks me up because I grew up saying I was never going to get married. Wow. Right? Okay. So you found the right one then. <laughs> yeah. And also I found someone who, I don't know, I never wanted to get married, but it was important to him. And he, he had made himself my family in ways I, I didn't even really realize until I had a family crisis mm -hmm. and he, he didn't ask me to think about him at all. He was doing things that I didn't even know he was doing. And that, yeah. and that's what convinced me is later a fa family members were saying like, Oh, when I was in the hospital, he was calling me every day. I, I didn't, I didn't right. tell him to do that. I didn't know. It was just, he loves that family member. Mm -hmm. I, I still have some issues with like the institution of marriage where it's also just kind of feels fundamentally unfair to me how much wealth mm -hmm. and stability is still built around being married or the fact that like the reason why I've had health insurance for a lot of the time is because of my husband, not mm. because it's something that's affordable or easy for everybody to have. But it's also hard because I am independent and have to work really hard to let people be there for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that is hard for a lot of us, kind of going back to the whole idea of, you know, we're supposed to be strong and we're supposed to have it together and we're supposed to be, you know, these boss ladies who run things. And yes, yeah. we are that in some ways, you know, but then there are those times where we may have to, Okay. Sometimes that gets tiring. Yeah. It gets tiring. And it, it is good to have someone that you can, you know, count on that you know is going to be there for you. I heard a woman say years ago something to the effect that um not that I, not that he would ever have to make all of the decisions, but in the off chance my husband did have to make all the decisions. He's the man I could trust to make the right decisions. I mean, I feel like that's how you actually know if you should get married sometimes. Mm. It's like the least sexy or romantic way to right. put it. <laughs> but it is like, will this person actually respect and honor me even if I can't make those choices? Mm -hmm. And that that's what makes getting married actually worth it. See, I'm not totally anti-marriage. I just right. <laughs> I just think that we could think about it a little more. Right, right. It's not always hearts and flowers and fancy dinners and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there are things that go a lot a lot deeper. So yeah, I mean, that's true. And these are some of the things, you know, that of course Josephine is thinking about. And but unfortunately, you know, where you and I can make, you know, we can make those decisions freely. In this particular case, she's making having to make decisions because the government is mandating <laughs> that she right. make certain decisions or walks through life in a certain way, which is like, wow, just thinking about in the story, just the whole thing. And we deal with it now, you mm -hmm. know, we're dealing with it with some of the choices that are being made for us in terms of the government, you know, Roe v. Wade and things like that, but how there is such this, misogynistic <laughs> push towards this is what your life should be. And your life is only going to be great if you do this. And this is what we want you to do. And this mm -hmm. is how we want you to show up. And this is what it means to be a woman. And this is what gives your life yeah. purpose. I, some of it too, it's his I, I don't know how much, and you're lucky if you haven't paid attention to this, but I've been following some like men right, men's rights activist stories. Mm -hmm. And some of them have like positioned the idea that the world, or at least the United States would be a better place if the government said women had to marry certain men and set up <laughs> this idea that all men deserve a wife if they want one. And it, I, I'm not gonna name the person who, put this out there because his <laughs> followers are awful and I don't want them right. to like search me. But it's one of those things that they they put out there as like something men deserve. Like men deserve companionship and uh what is it? A docile life. <laughs> Which, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but 
there's that growing like ease that a certain type of man feels about saying how a woman should be or what a ro woman's role is that it, it makes me even more worried about the future in some ways because we've been working so hard mm -hmm. for so long just to be treated like people. Mm -hmm. And it feels like no matter where you fall on row, the effects of it are dehumanizing. If you, like I, I was reading this story about how there's a woman in Texas right now who they know her baby is dead, but she's mm. being forced to carry it at risk to herself. And because they, it doesn't qualify, like they, the way the law was written, she still can't get an abortion. And that's what you need in that circumstance is where abortion so often is treated as just the, I'm not ready to be pregnant situation. But most abortions right. that women have in this country, it's for our health care. And it's to also make it so that we don't spend months of our life carrying a child that we desperately wanted. But for health reasons, it, it didn't live. Mm, that's just cruel. And it's just cruel. And it's that cruelty that's happening now that people feel is justified, but it's not. It, and I think that's the other reason why I wanted to write this book is just how often people feel comfortable doing cruel things, especially to women mm -hmm. because of misogyny and because we live in a culture where every time women start taking steps forward, we get yanked back because, I, I don't know, I used to be able to say like exactly why I thought these things were happening. And now I'm older and just feel more comfortable saying that we need to find ways to heal and for to get people to see people as other people. Mm -hmm. Because once we do that, it makes it much harder to be cruel. Right, right. We could all back to the collective we, and community, we could use a collective, a communal healing. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, they, you're right about that. Just so many things that are happening that, you know, create some of these issues and that, you know, I'm thinking even in the book, you know, you talk about some of a lot of these things are being politicized because, of course, in this story, there's a whole department that, you know, is, is looking out for witches and trying to try witches and send them to jail and, you know, mm -hmm. all these, or kill them or whatever it is. They're trying yeah. to do. So we know that there are governmental systems that are set up. There are people who are in place who aren't there for the greater good of us all. So. Yeah, it's so painful. I I thought in some ways it wouldn't hurt as much when I was older, but I think it hurts more because when I meet younger women now, I I keep thinking about how at least well I got I got to be in my thirties and have medical autonomy. Mm -hmm. You you lost it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, just changing. Let's yeah. a little bit. <laughs> of course, we're not going to do spoilers because we mm -hmm. don't do that. But in this story, you know, of course, Josephine's mother has disappeared. She's been gone for a very long time. And then she, um, mm -hmm. you know, her mother has passed away. And, you know, she's accepted the fact that her mother has passed away. And then through her mother's will, mm -hmm. she is given um, a task to go and um, just to get a little bit more information. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Get a little bit more information. Um, <coughs> so Excuse me. That really, for me in reading the story, was the beginning of, you know, Josephine was doing a lot of things, but that really shifted the trajectory of her life, mm -hmm. this, um, this task that she had to go complete. How important was it in the story for you to, well, I mean, of course, from the point of story, you got to have, you know, the big yeah. thing happening. We know that. But um, in doing that in the story, how important was it for you to have her kind of strike out on her own on this journey 
to finding herself? I I think it was the most important thing of the story where for a long time, I just had Josephine kind of staying put in the world. In the, the world is fun and some people were really interested in the idea of it, but there needed to be a reason for Josephine to look clearly at her life in some ways and also think about what was important to her as a person. And I, I think for most people, the easiest way to do it is to sometimes find a way to step away from it where you, you either go away on a vacation or even just something out of the ordinary, even like a walk in a new neighborhood Mm-hmm. or meeting someone who doesn't know anything about other people in your life, but you have to explain them, it suddenly clarifies the things that you're so used to because you have to explain them suddenly. You have to understand them because they're gone or you have to do this level of, all right, how do I explain my relationship to someone like Party City? How do I, right. how do, I do this? Mm-hmm. And so I think the book snapped together when I realized that there did need to be a reason for Joe to leave her ordinary life and see things maybe a little more clearly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I like what you said about you know what walking in a different neighborhood. I know you and I both talked about we've moved to new locations, you know, in the last yeah. you know few months or the last you know couple of years, and that is something that just opens up because it puts you in a new space and thinking of things differently and, you know, trying new things, meeting new people and things like that. And I I just really, you know, loved seeing her, you know, be a little afraid, you know, because of course you strike out and do something different, you're a little afraid, but then to get to a place that, you know, you know, I I wrote finding her safe space, ultimately, and then also finding her magic. and I'm still thinking about like what this means to me now after the book where I, I've been touring and it's the most travel I've done in a long time by myself. And just the ways people have reacted to me being like on a plane alone or at a restaurant mm-hmm. alone. It's really, it's really clarifying how often women just aren't expected still to go off by ourselves. I've had women who have noticed who are out with like their friends be like, aren't you nervous or scared? And my answer is usually no. I, but I'm surprised by that. I, I don't know why I've gotten to the point where I'm comfortable being alone in public, but I am. Yeah, that's good. And I guess me, see, I'm an only child. Yeah. Single, no children. So I'm used to it. You know, I'll go to concerts, I'll travel, you know, if I want to do something, I just do it, you know, or go out to dinner Mm -hmm. or a movie or whatever. I've just been accustomed to always doing that. And I think that it is good when you can find a level of comfort in your own skin and being able to, you know, get out and explore and learn things. Because one of the things and um, is when you always have somebody in your ear you know, mm-hmm. even, you don't even know what your own voice sounds like. Which is yeah. always- there, there's two like levels of advice. Like whenever young women especially come to me, like I, I, I teach undergraduates a lot and they'll ask me sometimes like, how, how did I become a writer or do these things? And like the first advice I give them is usually start going to movies by yourself. Just go and experience. Don't, don't look toward the other person just be alone and think about what you actually thought about this. You don't need to please anyone or worry about someone else's expectations, Mm -hmm. but it's like the first step sometimes to get you used to making art. You have to stop looking toward other people's approval to actually say what you mean. You have to be comfortable just in it. I mean, the other one is whoever you're with, they're your truest glass like ceiling. If they don't believe in your writing or your art, then you're going to have an even harder time doing it because they're not going to want you to make time for it. And you have to spend so much time just being alone and thinking to write a book or to paint or to do anything artistic, really. Mm-hmm. Or, or to start a business or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, there's time that you do have to 
you know, spend by yourself. And that's that, that what you just said was really rich right there. Just the whole fact that, you know, that person is kind of your ceiling. And if you're if you're always looking at what they're saying or their opinion or what they think, I mean, now if they if they are a positive person and can speak life into you, that's one thing. <laughs> or they're gonna encourage you or whatever. But if it's someone who isn't going to do that and be like, oh, you're always writing or you're always on that computer or you're right. always doing this. You know, what about me, me, me? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just something that's really important to think about. Yeah. Now, um, I do want to talk, kind of circle back to <laughs> um, Angie, who is Josephine's best friend. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the relationship that they had with one another. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that they had been friends for a long time, you know, they always looked out for each other. Yeah. Supported one another um, and really loved one another. <laughs> Realized, you know, you know, the ways in which they really loved one another. Um, and we kind of talk, spoke on it a little bit, just the importance of friendship and how important right. it is to have those people in your life that are really there for you. I I love friendship in novels. I think my favorite novels tend to have really good friends. And I think, you're, I think you'll probably ask me at the end what I'm reading or what you should read. So I'll save the book I was going to talk about for a minute. But I, we had talked earlier about friendships is romance. And I really wanted that feeling in the book where these two people aren't romantically involved, but they're still deeply caring for one another. Like the whole reason why I got into like Grey's, Grey's Anatomy, it, it was because Meredith and Christina's friendship where it was really, yeah, they talk about men, sure. Mm -hmm. But seeing a friendship where the women argue and come back together where they they push each other to be better and they also just laugh and feel things together and I think so often when you see friendships they're either like really surface level friendships where mm -hmm. it's just like here are all these two hot people here's all these hot people who hang out and they have nothing in common because this is a TV show right but they're gonna hang out and it's and I wanted to really spend time with people who both love each other dearly and annoy each other and make each other laugh mm -hmm. and just see one another. Because I think that's, I think the greatest gift friendship can give you, it's being seen, mm -hmm. it's being loved in a way where you know this person gets you. Mm -hmm. You know, as you were talking about that, I also thought about mm -hmm. Molly and Issa from oh, yeah because a lot of times if Issa talked about it people thought the relationship with her was Issa and Lawrence it was really Issa and Molly and you got to see all those ups and downs and ebbs and flow in their friendship yeah I I cried during the finale when mm -hmm. Issa is it is it fine if I spoil the finale of Insecure oh, that's fine because it's been around long enough that okay I've never seen it by now. <laughs> Yeah, but when <laughs> but when Issa is at Molly's wedding and just watching her from it, and Molly's so clearly happy, mm -hmm. and I cried. I, that was the part of the finale that actually made me cry because it was so relatable. Like you can fall out with someone a little bit, make your way back to them, and your relationship is richer, mm -hmm. and also you know, you're going to lose them a little bit through these different experiences. You just love them so much that even if you fall apart a little bit, you'll come back. Right. And I feel like she captured all of that so well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She definitely did a good job with that. Now, um, Wait, one side note, though. Do you think that Issa should have gone back together with Lawrence? Can we talk about that for one second? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. You might tell you this was a girlfriend chat. So, okay. um... I always was kind of rooting for her to get back with Lawrence. I, I'll admit. Okay. That was kind of I like mean, yeah. he's so handsome. Like, Yeah, that part. <laughs> he's so good looking. 
<laughs> even when he was acting like trash. Yeah. But, and I mean, but the reality of it is there are a lot of people kind of like the ebbs and flow in the friendship. There are a lot of people who go through a lot of changes in their relationships as well. And yeah. you know, sometimes they realize as they mature, they grow, you know, whatever. They do realize that they should have been together. So I wasn't I wasn't mad at them getting back together. I, like I think my only hold up is just there were so many times where Lawrence could have been a good friend to Issa because that's what you need. And so I was like, is this a good idea, girl? Like <laughs> <sighs> They had that beautiful life at the end, so it's probably right. fine, sure. Yeah. But yeah. if they were in real life, I'd be I'd be watching like, Lawrence all the time. <laughs> I'd be like, if you you better be respectful to her. Yeah, you better act right, because we're not putting up with your foolishness again. <laughs> yeah. Oh my okay. Yeah, but that's fine. That's fine. Cause you know, so this is just girlfriend chat here. But um, in terms of your writing, I know that you, you know, we're talking yeah. about you know some of the things you share with some of your students and things like that in, in terms of writing. So if anyone is watching when, who is a writer or thinking about becoming a writer, just tell us a little bit about what you led you to write and some a little bit of what your process normally is, like when you're putting together a novel, you know, kind of what your process is. Yeah. So first, how I got started writing is I've I've always just liked it a lot. For a long time, I wanted to be a poet, but I don't know. I was not very good at it. And the more time I spent trying to do it, the more it was clear that I was just writing stories of line breaks. So why not write a full story? Why not actually do the thing I like? And that was kind of a big gift to me that I that I didn't just give up on writing because I was feeling really bad about myself. And I think it's really easy when you have like the set idea of what you're good at or what you should be to kind of just give up instead of looking around and being like, well, these are the things I'm actually trying to do. How about I just do those things? Right. And then for writing a book, like even before that process where I'm trying to be creative and it's really hard to do, is that I first set myself up with um, different journals where I keep track of my dreams. And if I don't feel self-conscious writing dreams, that usually helps me write the rest of the day. Mm. I Or I write down a lot of images of things that I notice out in the world while I'm walking around or I'm on a bus. I, I love eavesdropping mm-hmm. it's so much. And that helps me write. And then for writing a novel, I think... I think I'm lucky because I'm a writer who actually likes writing. Like there are a lot of writers who don't really like writing because it's scary. Like you keep putting yourself out there all the time. It's a white page. And also it can be really frustrating to sit there and see all of your mistakes. And it just depends on your attitude toward it, but also just how you feel about those things. There's some people who are comfortable with it. And for some people, they kind of just have to grit their teeth and make it through the draft Mm -hmm. so that they can get to the part that they like, that's revision. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to be the type of person who likes both. I don't, I don't mind the mistakes because I know I can fix them. Right. And then I like revision because usually my first drafts are really, really bad. I cannot emphasize that they're (laughs) usually really bad. (laughs) <laughs> and then I take a lot of time revising and working on them. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things, and, you know, in this story uh, in particular, you know, you're creating, you know, there's the quote unquote real world, you know, the things that yeah. we know, like I talked about, you know, Michigan and going to Myers, which I'm familiar <laughs> with going to Myers since I like, <laughs> Michigan or, you know, just different things or, you know, yeah. going to the Upper Peninsula and what that drive is like and things like that. But then there's also the created world. So that that kind of puts you in a different mind space as well, because, you know, you could write, you know, about the stuff that you see from day to day. But then there are those things that, you know, you've kind of created, you know, this quote unquote utopia <laughs> yeah. you know, and other things that the characters are experiencing so Mm -hmm. how was that process because that's to me that's a different part of the brain so to speak that was the most fun where i've written two books now that kind of get into social issues Mm -hmm. and i never plan on i never sit down and think i'm gonna write a book that's about 
how women are treated, or I'm going to write a book about research studies and black healthcare, mm -hmm. where it, those are the things I'm mad about. And they come out when I'm writing the draft. And I know that the easiest way to get through writing is to have fun. So I, mm -hmm. I find it fun to have elements that aren't of the real world. It keeps me actually involved. And it also makes it so it doesn't sound like I'm just writing a Facebook post. It's like, let me tell you how I feel. Right, right, right. So it gives me the energy for like the harder emotional moments or for the more scary or some of the more violent moments. Although I promise this book is not that violent or that it scary isn't. if you haven't read it. It is. There, there's like some small bits of it. Right. Okay. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, because people might think witch and think all kinds of it's it's not that. <laughs> I can yeah, tell you. it's not. <laughs> I promise. You know, as I, I was mean, reading, I wasn't like, oh my god, you know, I didn't, there was nothing in there that was just so far out of whack. <laughs> Cause you know, yeah. as I was telling you before we came on, one of the things in the midst of the story, and I have a lot of places where I highlighted stuff and mm -hmm. you know, folded down pages. One of the things that I really love about this book is just the truth that you talk in the, about in this book. I mean, just things that people are, are going through or some of the realities of what it means to be a black woman in America or, you know, just, you know, wisdom, you know, that it might maybe an older woman is speaking to a younger woman or, you know, a father is speaking to his daughter in some instances. That was one of the things I highlighted and bookmarked a lot of that stuff in the story. I think a lot about wisdom. Like that's my favorite part of getting older is mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm wise yet. Oh, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, but at least for me, I, I don't really think I'm that wise of a person. I mean, I mean, I'm really hard on myself. I feel like you've gotten the vibe from our conversations. Yeah. I'm, I'm someone who's really hot, hard on myself, but anytime someone sits me down with wisdom, like when I was a teenager, I, I could not handle it. I was like, don't tell me what to do. I'll figure it out. I was, oh, I was such a brat. Um, <laughs> but now I have the wisdom to acknowledge I was a brat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, it's still like the joy now of having someone sit me down. And even if I don't always agree with what they're saying, it's it's now having, I guess, maybe the grace or maybe it's wisdom now to know that they're just trying to take care of me. Right. I don't have to take what they're saying as gospel. I I can see the care now. I can see the ways that people just want me to be okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's important and that's powerful. But yeah, I had to tell you. Well, I told you that before, but I wanted to say it publicly that yes, yeah, <laughs> there are a lot of little things. I'm like, oh, I need to write that down. I might need to put that on a post it. I might need to. Yeah, there's some spots in there with things that are said. And I'm like, yeah. It, things that even relate to stuff I might be going through right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hold on, I just have one right here. Um, it says, um, she liked to, um, someone saying, she liked to talk about how people could add value to things, but that on average, they couldn't add value to people and people could maybe add value to people, but most people weren't interested in doing that. And I'm like, wow, that's so true. A lot of people aren't interested in helping but somebody. we should be. You know, <laughs> oh, think of what the world would be like if people on average, like we wanted to add value to other people, if we wanted to see them and just show up for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, when I, if you see that on a tweet or something, <laughs> I promise to give you credit. <laughs> It's okay. You got me here. You can have the first one for free. <laughs> but yes, now one of the things you did mention, because our time is almost up, believe it or not. Oh. But yes. <laughs> but one of the things you mentioned, you said something about what you're reading. What are you reading right now? Or okay. thinking about or talking about reading. So I'm reading, I just finished Jackal by Aaron Adams. It comes out in late, not late October. I think it's early October. Mm -hmm. And it's a debut book. And it's, it's a debut book by a black woman. Mm -hmm. and, but it is a horror book. So if you're scared of 
things, and especially because it does involve like violence against black women. I, I do want to give you all a content okay. warning because it's about black women going to sleepovers with all white friends and then disappearing. Ooh. And another black woman trying to save these women and investigate what's going on here. Mm -hmm. But the writing is beautiful, and I think it speaks a lot to, especially if you're from like a rural place, the kind of fears that you might have had growing up. And what's the name of it again? It's called Jackal. Jackal, J-A-C-K-A-L by? Mm -hmm. Aaron Adams. E-R-I-N? Yep. Adams. All right, y'all heard it first here. Be on the lookout for Jackal by Aaron Adams. If you are okay with reading something, it might spook you a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. So um, any other suggestions or things that you have been reading or I know you, you're busy? Well, another book I read, okay, this is by Chantel Johnson. And this is also a debut book. It's called Post Traumatic. I'm going to give you all a content warning again, because it involved someone overcoming the fact that she was sexually abused as a child. And mm -hmm. now she's working as a social worker. But it's also another book about how like friendships sustain us mm -hmm. and how, especially if you find someone who's gone through the same traumas or things that have harmed you, you can build a new home because they'll always understand you. Okay. And the book is also funny in ways I did not expect it to be. And also, I think the first chapter of it, it's one of the best, best first chapters of a book I've read in a long time because it involves the main character going to work and trying to solve a situation that's so dramatic because she's a social worker. Mm -hmm. And the way she feels after it is so good. Okay. And it made me keep reading the rest of the book. All Even right. though I, it's not usually the kind of thing I would read because I have a, I don't know, I have a hard time reading books that are about sexual violence. I, yeah, understandably so. Mm -hmm. And that's post traumatic by Chantel. I'm writing these things down. Yeah. It's by Chantel Johnson, and it Johnson. came out. I think it came out in April this year. Okay. I'll be on the lookout for that. And we have a comment from Laura, who is who said, "Thank you for these insights. So looking forward to my book arriving. Sustaining hope for the best in humanity. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, well, thanks for buying my book, Laura. Yes." Oh, and this, uh, and the, I know who this person is. See, I wasn't crazy when I didn't want to spend <laughs> years with my friend and all her, all her white friends. <laughs> no, that's legit. Yeah. No, that's real. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, because folks, mm, you never mm -hmm. know. And I, I kind of feel the same way. Um, that's actually my best friend. But I kind of feel the same way. I had a friend who used to always say, you know, she would go hang out with other friends for lunch or dinner or whatever. Oh, come on over to so-and-so's house. We're having a barbecue. I was like, I'm not trying to be the barbecue meat. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> or even the fact, because sometimes, you know, all jokes aside, that person might be cool with you as an individual, but you don't know what their friends are about. Yeah, it's really hard to find people. I mean, and this is across all races, though. It's right. really That's hard to find crazy. people with good taste and friends. Mm -hmm. Where, And also to trust someone enough that when you say, like, hey, your friend said something wild to me, mm. for them to immediately be like, oh, I'm so sorry, rather than like, my friend would never do that. Right, right. Not, not, you know, you're not wanting to believe that their friend would do such a thing. Well, I have had so much fun talking to you. It is eight. Me too. Can you believe it? It's been a I whole hour. It. it didn't feel like it. No. <laughs> we actually started offline a few minutes before. So, you know, I always hope that my guests can have a good time coming and, and chatting with us. So I uh, guess last question, are there any mm -hmm. events, um, in-person events or, you know, more online events that people can keep up with you or, you know, talk to you or come out and maybe, you know, get a book signed or whatever the case may be? Yeah. So the next two events I'm doing in person and they're open to the public. One is, it's called the Booksmarks Festival. So if you're in the Winston-Salem, North Carolina area, it's a huge book festival. And I'll be there signing books and reading. And then the next one that's in person, it's the Southern, and that's an act, the next one's in October after that. It's in Nashville, Tennessee at the okay. Southern Humanities Book Festival. Okay, okay. Yeah, my best friend's family is from Nashville. So, hey, girl, tell your family to go out there and support me. 
<laughs> and then online, the next one, I think I have another one this week, but I just forgot it because I've been in like five time zones over the past wow, week. Wow. Well, but yes. in the first week of September, I'm going to do a free conversation and it will be online with, um, I just forgot how to pronounce Nana's last name. Um, but I think his last name is pronounced Ajay, like Nana Ajay. He wrote Fi Friday Black. Okay, I'm familiar with the book. Mm -hmm. And we're, I also just think you would like Nana and his new book's coming out next year. Okay. He, he would love talking to you. Okay, Custom. okay. Yeah, I have to bring some more <laughs> men in because I will admit it's, it's generally women. There's been a couple of guys, but hey, you know, I can I can spread my wings and fly. <laughs> yeah, but he would, he would love to talk to you, I think, because his book is a lot about women okay. and how they relate to one another. And also, he's just funny. Okay, he's well, man, I'll say right right out, he's funny. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with Friday Black, so I'm writing that but down. Yeah. So They're having the two of us talk about humor and also horror and fiction together. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Well, thank you so much again for your time. I appreciate you in your Airbnb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody should be quick to tell me that. Like, this is not my house. <laughs> no, this is not my house. Don't tell people I pan my room this color. <laughs> but if you like it, it's cool. Yeah, it's um, cool. It's cool if you like it. You know, it looks warm and cozy. I will say that much. So. It is cozy, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So well, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. I'm going to make a really quick announcement for next week's. But well, actually, if you don't mind, I, I'll do it with you here if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, let's stick around. <laughs> Yes. Um, next week, I will be talking um, with, and I might not say this right, it's Abi Ishola Ayodeji. Her book okay. is Patience is a Subtle Thief. So we will be on next week, 829, also at 8 o'clock p.m. So be on the lookout for that. Um, the following week is the holiday, so I will not be um, hosting anything on the holiday on Labor Day. Actually, I'll be traveling, and then the following I'll be, week I'll be back and you know carry through the month of September, which also happens to be my birthday month, so you never know Happy what birthday. might pop up. Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> everybody, as always, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining. Thank you for watching and sharing, and you know we really appreciate you. Please go out and support Megan, The Women Could Fly, or her first, her previous book, Lakewood. Please, you know, we deserve good Black women writers. We need to show publishers that they are here, and that we're interested in the stories that they're telling. So please, when you get an opportunity, support, you know, buy it, you know, ask that they have it in your libraries, all those different spaces. Just make sure that these stories are able to be told. So I will see everyone the next time and you all have a good one. Hang on for a second for me, but everybody else, y'all have a good night. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.